In the 17th century, an inspiring host gathered people together, the purpose to increase their knowledge through conversation. These gatherings were called salons. Guests would debate a topic for the evening, mostly books, then eat and drink tea. You know, advocating Kukai Tobi, there's a difference, you know, um, if you drink with, uh, uh, we call it Libiki Riwar. The taste of uh, uh, tea from a beaker from Domingo <laughs> and from oh, this lovely crockery, it's so different. Thank you so much. So people were saying to me, what is going on at UGA that the vice chancellor starts his high tea with the VC by talking about witchcraft? It's not the witchcraft that I'm interested in. It's the story behind the witchcraft in a sense that it resulted in court cases. And, and, and the aim is to look at how things were then, where we are today, and where we may want to be. Or for us to talk about where we should be. And, 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 and I couldn't have chosen better guests, you know. Um, Advocate Nkukai Tobi, a courtroom is your, is your thing. And I also needed somebody who would bring a different perspective and who would be better qualified than a professor of theology and our leader here, the executive director of the UJ Library. Ladies and gentlemen, I chose this book because it, it really got me thinking. Firstly, it's difficult to buy this book, you know, brand new, to get it. I got a copy from, you won't believe this, a head ranger, a ranger of a private game reserve. I was, we were on holidays, and we started talking, uh, Prof. Anna Mutiti, about, um, about uh, plants, medicinal plants. And then we shifted to how some of these medicinal plants and animals are being killed for traditional medicine, and some of it is not even about healing, as we are told, is witchcraft. And then we strayed into books. We talked about Bushman painting, and then we talked about a book that he's got, and he gave me that book, and I couldn't put it down. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this book talks about a number of court cases that ended up in court in the Transk, and in the experience of the people and the things that they dealt with, it's a lot that we cannot deal with all of them at once. So I picked a few. And that really got me thinking. One of them, it's, uh, state versus, it's about State versus Mbombela, the criminal court case that was also turned into a movie where this guy says, uh, or thought was killing Itogolosh, the evil spirit, and ended up killing a child. The intention was not to kill a human being, but a child ended up uh, uh, being killed. And the court had to deal with this. Imagine a judge who doesn't understand this thing, obviously a white judge, and I'm not saying, and I don't have anything against my colleagues who are white, who are watching, uh, who are present here and watching, who had to first understand this. This person says he's killing an evil spirit, and he believed that he was killing an evil spirit. So what do you do? And the judge had to deal with that matter. And obviously there's also a case of a woman whose husband told her that, you, you know, I'm, I'm going to kill you and made these threats repeatedly, she went to a sub-headman to report this, and, 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 and one evening he came drunk and he said, come here, bring the sugarcane knife, and another thing, and another machete or something like that, and he put it next to the bed and said, tonight is your last night. And when he was sleeping there, I don't know, he had too much to drink, the woman took that uh, sugarcane knife and chopped the man to protect herself against the men who brought all these things to kill herself. And these are the things that the courts had to deal with. And witchcraft was thought to be in play because you know, this guy was talking about a young man who was sent to bring a particular type of a goat so that he can get blood to mix with, with medicine. Another one involved a um, young man who um, you know, uh, ended up uh, killing a person because the traditional healer, in the book they say witch doctor, said uh, you need certain parts of a, a person, a man, a boy, 
uh, genitals of a boy so that they can be mixed with medicine so that it can, it can make them strong. And they ended up killing people. Another one which was really sad to us where this young girl lost her blanket and the blanket disappeared. And eventually they ended up at the witch doctor to throw the bones to see where the blanket uh, disappeared to. And the witch doctor said, no, the blanket was taken by somebody who stays in a heart on the left hand side, something like that, something as vague as that. And the sad part is that um, the, the, the witch doctor said this blanket was taken by a tokoloshi, an evil spirit, is in the river, somebody's going to die. And the lady talked to um, his brothers and then somebody ended up being killed because of this. And sadly, this happened many years ago, uh, but even today we still have people who are being killed because of that and our courts have to deal with this. But the one that really got me thinking, ladies and gentlemen, and I want to speak a little bit about it and then I'll tell you uh, what next and what I think, is a case involving a man who had to go and testify at a second court. The magistrate sends a policeman to his uh, village or his crawl, as they call it in here. Before I even talk about this, I must emphasize something that, firstly, I don't glorify witchcraft. Secondly, I don't support the words that are used here, which were used during that time. They talk about Bantu, they use the K word, and so on. I don't support that, but if you take the substance of this, really, it's relevant for us today. So the magistrate sent a, um, a policeman to go to this crawl, various crawls, to tell the people that the judge will be coming to, um, the judge will be coming to hear this matter. So all the witnesses must come to um, uh, testify. But he said something. The magistrate said that the judge would not like it when you natives have got the tendency of walking around naked. When you come to court, please come dressed. And this poor guy had to go to another village looking for uh, clothes, to borrow clothes. So when he went to some um, village, they were told that no, 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 no. Um, the, the clothes are not available. The young men took them to um, when they went to Joburg. They went to another village. They found that the, the guy who has been arrested for murder, the people will be testifying on his side have already secured the pants that are available. So he went to um, uh, another village, and then that is where he got uh, him and, and, and his brother-in-law, they got uh, some pants that were available, but that didn't fit. And this tells you about the trouble that people had to go through to go to court, which was foreign to them. Um, I'll read you what he said. He said, fortunately, I have a friend who resides some miles from my crawl, and to him I applied. And after some hesitation, he consented to lend me one pair, that is, pair of pants. Imagine, advocate, you have a witness to testify. They have to start by borrowing pants. He says, Bambela obtained, that is uh, the guy that was going with him, Bambela obtained a pair from a sweetheart of his sister. I fortunately possessed a pair of boots which have been given to me many years ago by a friend who assisted at the looting of a trader store during the last Kaleka war. They were hard and well smoked, having lived on the roof of my hut for some years. But as I had never worn boots before, it did not occur to me that either age or smoke would in any way affect my comfort. All things considered, I came to the conclusion that there was no cause to doubt that my personal get-up would be otherwise than uh, creditable to a man of my position. I was extremely anxious for the trial to come, uh, or to come on, as I felt if I once could explain the matter to the judge, the extermination of Vam Senior and his family from our side of the country would not take long. Vam Senior was charged. Now, this guy had to borrow clothes to go and testify, but it's not something that is something that, you know, they live with. He had to borrow shoes, uh, take old shoes, and so on. And when you, you read this, you'll see that this guy really struggled with things. He says, I cannot remember when I last wore European clothes, and I was much excited that the idea of having to put them on. It took some time to get the trousers on. All my companions assisted me and I was reduced to a condition of intense moisture when Bambela announced that they were on enough. So we tied them round the waist with a strip of cotton blanket and then put on that hat and coat which I had borrowed, by the way. Bambela now appeared to brace himself together. He expectorated carefully upon his hands, 
um, and seized the boots. I could see very clearly that the real agony was about to commence. The women seized my legs and held it firmly. Bambela turned his back to me and put one of his legs on each side of mine, caught hold of the boot with both hands, and while I clung desperately to the stem of the thorn tree, he pulled like an ox, until, to our surprise, the waistband of the trousers broke. The astonishment of the women was great as they could not understand the connection between the waistband and the boot. Bambela, who is a man of determined character, was not daunted by these troubles and assured us that it was all right. So the trio once more bent their backs to the boot question with the result that both were eventually reported to be on. I heaved a deep sigh of relief and with the assistance of the women managed to get on to my feet. I cannot describe to you my feelings as I stood on the ground in my new gap. I felt like a bird in a snare. The trousers irritate me beyond measure. But oh, the boots, they nearly drove me mad. My feet, which had lived a life of freedom until this day, are large and broad. And when they got into these hard boots, which were originally constructed for a white man, it seemed to me as if my feet were being quietly roasted in a fire. I lost my temper, abused the women, cursed Vam Singer, and was about to strike Nolente for not answering me when I spoke to her when Bambela came to the rescue and suggested that the boots should be taken off and carried by the women. I acted upon his suggestion and felt greatly relieved. Now you can see that thing of, you know, chauvinistic thing that the women must carry the boots and all that is the time. But imagine the agony these poor men had to go through just to go and testify. Ladies and gentlemen, I chose this book just to say we come a long way. Today there are lots of things that we take for granted. There are people who say our courts are not decolonized enough. A lot has been done, but the question is, is it enough? And I'll talk a little bit about this. I'm sure you are all now curious to hear what became of this man. He, he of course, traveled to the next village near to the court. And the next morning, shortly after sunrise, he says, we duly appeared at the courthouse, having passed the night at the crawl of a Galeka friend who has for many years, I hope I pronounce it correctly, Galeka? Galeka friend, thank you, who has for many years resided among the Fingos. He was very hospitable, killing a goat for us and showing us all the attention he could. We gave him full details on the case and he sympathized with us. I experienced some difficulty in dressing before starting for court. But as my host is a man accustomed to European clothes, he rendered valuable assistance facilitating the boots travel with an application of lard, thus enabling us to reach the office without a mishap. Ladies and gentlemen, in the interest of time, they waited for the judge to arrive and they were waiting there. Now, he is sure that he would do well. And when, when the uh, judge arrived, you know, riding with the horse, with, with beautiful horses, firstly, he was impressed by these magnificent animals. He never saw such horses. Where he came from, the horses were, you know, working horses, not like the ones that, you know, would ferry a judge, well kept. But the trouble was in the court. He says, I was greatly surprised when I entered the courtroom to notice how large it was. The roof appeared so high that it hurt my neck to look at it. The people inside seemed smaller than usual and were distributed about in so many different places and nooks. I became confused and felt as if I was in some other world. Now, advocate, you are always in court. It's your playground. But what about the witnesses that come? Our people are accustomed to this. Do they understand what is going on? I had a homeboy who attacked a taxi driver, and I'm not saying taxi drivers should be addressed. When he had our studying law, he said to me, homeboy, I want to tell you something. Your law is something, and your courts are amazing. He said, look, I was going to, test, uh, to appear as, a, as an accused person at the magistrate court in, 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 in Hammanskral, in the Hammanskral area, Temba. And, uh, and, and in the morning, I said, I'm going to tell that magistrate where to get off. So he had a, a, a bottle of black label, Zamalek. He finished it to, you know, villagers say, to get black, you know, to charge up his courage. And he said, the moment... They said, all rise. He said he became sober instantly. He said, that place is such a scary place, you know. And all of us, even those who studied law, we prayed not to be called to testify or to appear in court because it's a scary thing. 
and it's something that we take for granted. The experience of this man is what our people are going through every day. What can we do to deal with this so that people understand this? Now, he says, um, um, you know, the judge sat there and he was in awe and, and, and he was asking me all sorts of questions. He said, but what I was most struck with was the judge. Was he human? Did he eat? Had he arms? Did he ever take off those clothes? Now referring to the gown. Was he standing or sitting? Could he see that I was standing there? Were thoughts which rushed through his mind. He appeared to me to move occasionally on the right side, and that was the only sign of life I could perceive. His eyes were pink and appeared to look at nothing. He had peculiar hair such as I have only once before seen upon white men, a white man, and he had glass over his eyes. His coat was most magnificent, mag mag magnificent, and I thought I was in the presence of a spirit. I was appalled. Never before had I seen such a sight, but I felt assured that there was one who was far above being influenced to unfairness from one side or the other. But now the problem started when he had to testify. He says, I felt too loose in some places and in others too tight. Remember the clothes. My coat was so tight across my chest that I could not breathe. It was clear to me that if something did not happen soon, I would die. I became firmly impressed with the idea that Ram Singer, that is the accused, was the cause of this by means of his medicines. Now he believes in traditional medicine. He said the old gentleman who spoke the K, uh, K word, I won't, I won't use it, held up two fingers of his right hand and told me to speak the truth. So help me God. This is solemnly declared I would do. And when I was about to add that it was against my conscience to uh, deviate from the strict lines of truth, when before my chiefs, he told me to cut it short and say, so help me God, which I did. I felt proud as I held up my hand and displayed the absence of the first joint of the little finger, Ingriti, by which the fingers could see that I was a tr true kaleka. Now, the problem here is that as he was testifying, they put some, you know, statements to him. He says, eh, we, eh, we, eh, we. As you'd know, eh, we means yes. But he was not agreeing to what was being said. And to his dismay, he says that he was shocked when he was told, maybe let me read this quickly before I sit down and I'll tell you where we are going. He's saying, according to our Kaleka custom, I ascended to each sentence with a loud, eh, we, as we always do. No Kaleka can go on talking to another person unless he receives some reply. He would cease speaking and say, it is no use addressing a deaf and dumb man. So when this long man with the mtikis spoke to me, I ascended in accordance with our custom. Notwithstanding that, he told me some things which I did not agree to. I answered yes as a sign that I was listening. I presumed as it is always the case in our Kaleka courts, now these are traditional courts, he would presently sit down and tell me, Kuba, go on. Then I would thunder forth in my best style what I knew convincing everyone in the court that I was an orator and counsel of the chief. But it presently appeared such was not to be the case for, uh, after repeating a few more statements to me, the gentleman in the mtika stared at me from under his eyebrows for a few seconds, showed the whites of his eyes, shrugged his shoulders, said a few words to the judge in a despairing manner, and sat down. This puzzled me, but what followed puzzled me more. The judge suddenly appeared to be moving. His face became red. He spoke to the old gentleman, and it was quite clear to me that he was very angry. The old man then addressed me as follows. The judge says you are not speaking the truth. You made one statement before the magistrate, and now you make another. You are an old man, and it is correct to presume that as such, you would have more respect for the truth than a boy. But this does not appear to be the case. You are fortunate in escaping a prosecution for false swearing and a long term of imprisonment. You may go, but consider yourself fortunate in being allowed your freedom. While all this was going on, I was thinking of Ram Singer, the accused. How fortunate he had been in obtaining such good medicine, and how thoroughly by its use he had overthrown me. 
Needless to say, the guy was thrown out uh, for lying and all that. I wish to pause here with a few questions that I hope we can discuss. There's a lot to be said, but I need to read this for you just to feel how captivating this is. And to believe me when I say it was not the witchcraft part that attracted me to this book. It's about how many people even today of our people understand the court processes. How many people uh, can be uh, prosecuted or be allowed to speak in their own language? How often do we use English instead of other languages? And language and culture are interlinked. He talks about men that surrounded this judge, assessors, of course, all men. How far we have come, ladies and gentlemen. Today we've got um, uh, judges of all races, but is this representative enough? Recently, the Chief Justice talked about the stat statistics, which were, uh, we still have, uh, are almost at appalling, but which tells us we have a long way to go. If I come to women, ladies and gentlemen, in how many centuries we, first, we, we now have a Deputy Chief Justice who's a woman? How many years are we going to wait before we have a Chief Justice who's a woman? It's a long way to go. We've got a lot to achieve. It, reminds, it reminded me of the words of our late president, uh, former president Nelson Mandela, in the famous speech, a, white, a black man in a white man's court, who said, look, I'm being tried by laws that my people didn't play a role in electing the people that are in parliament who uh, you know, passed these laws. Today, we are being tried. Court proceedings are ran using the laws that we can say these are laws that represent our current constitutional democracy. There are things that we have achieved, to the point that those that say our courts are not decolonized I say, no, this is not true, because there are those who say we need to bring back the laws of Shaka Zulu. But here we see the clash of a man who is a brilliant orator in his tribal court, but in a court that he's not familiar with, he ended up being thrown out and the person who was charged with murder walking. Obviously, we need to look at these things. My sense is that we definitely need to do more but we come a long way in addressing some of these challenges. The last thing, which my predecessor, Professor Marwala, addressed a lot, is the issue of believing in all these spirits and all those things, that we need to work hard in educating our people. We still have challenges today where people are arrested because, sorry, because they went to some witch doctor who told them that X is bewitching me, and then people's houses are burned. The older you look, the older you are, then you must supposed, you're supposed to be the worst witch around. Let me pause there so that I don't take all the time. Hopefully there's enough we can engage on this. The idea is to discuss this around our court system in terms of what needs to be done, how far we have come, where people had to borrow pens to go to court that didn't fit, smoked uh, 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 boots that, you know, uh, 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 you know, didn't fit, and so on. Thank you so much for your attention. I'm looking forward to the engagement. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Um, thank, thank you, Professor. Um, what I propose to do is to, uh, this is meant to be a response, but there's no point in responding. <laughs> the presentation was excellent. But I want to extrapolate uh, themes for conversation. Mm. Hopefully I can do that in less than 10 minutes. So the, the first is just to situate the, the case, I'm going to talk only of the Msakwa Paulwa yeah. case. I think that is his name. Uh, Umsa is the day, Paula is to make a mark. Oh. Or, you know, usually you do that when you're cutting the ear of a cow, you know, or the ear of a, a sheep to make your mark. So the, the time when this trial is taking place is 1890 uh, in Butterworth, um, and that's the uh, couple of years after the last war of Naekribi, um, when the Tossas are finally defeated by the British and put under colonial rule. But the Tossa systems of dispute resolutions are still uh, alive. There's still a dual system where if you are suspected of witchcraft, this is where you are taken suspected of uh, murder, this is where you are taken. But the British are trying to impose the colonial adjudicative system. And so what they do, they then bring all cases, because what they want to do is to create a uniform system. And then 
to submerge the Tosa system under the British rule. So that's the context of the, of the, of the trial. And just on the basic facts about what has happened is that Mshagwa uh, Paula is being called as a witness, as you've heard from the professor. What is he witnessing? There is a case against a fellow called Vamsinya. Uh, Vamsinya is Uguva is to hear Msinya quickly, so, so someone who hears quickly or fast, a fast listener, quick listener, you can call it like that. He is charged for burning a house of a woman called Noaiti. Noaiti is the wife of Mshaka Paula. So he burns the house because what is happening in Tosaland is that the way to punish a witch is to burn their house. And if they are inside the house, so much the better. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that is what the charge is about. It's a charge of witchcraft in that context. So Vamsenya then goes to a witch doctor, uh, or a sangomo. In fact, I think in the book it's called Sanusi, mm -hmm. somebody who can smell where the, the problems are. And then they give him a, a root in Nambu, you know, which uh, they need to chew and spit out in court in order to confuse everyone so that he can be acquitted. So Vamsinya believes this, and he actually uses this medicine. He takes this uh, uh, in Nambu, uh, chews it, and then constantly spits it. But what is actually happening is that Nshakwa Paula doesn't know what's happening inside. You remember the book uh, Kafka? You know, uh, if you remember the, the book set in, in Eastern Europe called uh, Kafka. It's almost a Kafka scene, you know, where someone is brought into court. They are not told what the charge is, you know. Um, uh, and, that in, and the character in Kafka is Joseph K. You're brought into a court. There's a, a foreign language that's being used. You just don't know what's happening, you know. So, so Mshaka Paula is a character like Joseph K, who goes into this uh, building called the courtroom, and he has to listen to a foreign language being uh, 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 interpreted via an interpreter. Who, the interpretation itself is not good enough. Mm. So a lot is lost between what the judges are saying and what he is saying in turn to them, you know, because the interpretation systems are not yet that advanced. And also it's a time, it's, this is 1890, so it's a time when even the understanding of the two languages is at an infancy stage. So there's no fluency on both sides. Mm -hmm. So a lost is then lost uh, in between. So what he then witnesses are these uh, instances that prof, uh, 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 the prof was talking about, which is he sees this judge. But what will strike you is that he sees this judge, he compares them to two of the greatest chiefs or the greatest kings among the Kosa, Uzanzolo Ngosi uh, Uinza, uh, who ruled Kosa land between 1820 and 1835, uh, when he was murdered by the British, uh, basically shot him three times, and they chopped his head off, uh, cut his ears, right? And uh, they took the head to Scotland, never brought it. You know. Now, when he is there, he is comparing the wisdom of Zanzolo, the greatest king of the Tosa, with this foreigner called the judge, whom he does not know. He also refers to the counselors of Zanzolo, right? That the people that spoke in the trials of Zanzolo were the counselors, right? But everyone spoke, you know, each counselor spoke. And the way these counselors uh, uh, spoke is they addressed themselves in ways that would impress everyone in their beautiful oratory skills. They could convince anyone and everyone. Kheli, uh, who is also referred to, his name is Sakhil, is the son of Zanzolo. He's the son of Hinza. Uh, Hinza's father is Kauta. And uh, Hinza is killed in the presence, in 1835, he's killed in the presence of uh, Sakhil. Sakhili at that point is very young, he's about 11 years old. But witnesses this really gruesome murder of his, of his father. So Kheli is someone who knows how brutal the British are, how evil basically the, the British are. 
And so he had decided that he is not going to engage in a physical war with the British. And he is, in fact, going to try a system of accommodation, you know, whereby some Tosas will be allowed to convert and become Christians. They will go into the English uh, systems. So there's a clash of cultures. But this is a clash of, cu of cultures that's not happening among the equals, because militarily the British have defeated the, 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 the Tos. So what Mthlakwa Paola witnesses, firstly, he questions the legitimacy of the person sitting there as a judge, because he's a foreigner. And then he says, well, but if you look at uh, Zanzolo, the greatest king of the Tosa, uh, Inza, Inza is one of us. It's one of us. So the decisions are decisions we know because we know who our king is. So he's going to be. And then he also makes the comparison with Sakhil. He says, even with Sakhil, Sakhil is one of us. So we know the decisions are made. And then he talks about these people that are wearing imitika. Imitika are gowns. He says, I'm sitting behind these people. I don't even see their mouths. I just see their backs, right? I don't see them speaking. And even when they speak, I don't hear them. Mm -hmm. But in the house of traditional leadership, in the house of Zanzolo or in the house of Kheli, we see everyone speaking. We see everyone speaking. And the decision there seems to be made by everyone. And then comes this instance that the professor was talking about, which is the actual evidence. Because he is sure of his story. He knows that he did witness the burning of the house. And he knows that he did witness the burning of the house because of this allegation of witchcraft, which is an allegation he denies, which also shows that even within the Kosa community, witchcraft was not generally believed by everyone. There was contestation there, unlike the way the whites saw African society as basically homogenous and believing the same thing all the time. When it comes to that moment of testimony, he is then asked only a few questions by this stranger that he has never met, who is wearing this umtika, this gown. And this stranger is asking him, preliminary questions as a foundation. But he doesn't know that this is evidence. He remembers being told to swear. He doesn't know what he's swearing on. Then he answers these questions. But as, uh, as you heard from Professor Mpedi, his answers are not to say, yes, it happened or it didn't happen. But he says, if I had been in the council of Kosaland, what would have happened is that I would have been allowed, uh, someone would have spoken to me, and that I would have said, yes, uh, you know. If you remember the book, mm. which sets the context in which a closer trial takes place. And you hear there, Dimangel, Ambis, Dimangel Ubabin, Ambis. That's not because you agree. You're saying, I understand what you're saying. Carry on, carry on, carry on. Once you are finished, you will give me a chance to talk. This idea too fro, too fro, too fro, is foreign to us. Mm. That's not how we speak, right? You give a person a chance, you don't interrupt them. They finish and they sit down. Somebody else stands up. But this argumentation called cross-examination is not how we do trials, right? So you get another clash there, that the way these trials are done is actually not the same. And then that is why eventually he is shocked when he is told that he is about to be charged for lying in court. Because he's wondering, what did I lie? Because I've not said anything. Mm. <laughs> so I'm about to speak. And I'm told to shut up. This is where then Vamsinya is acquitted. Vamsinya, after the trial, goes to uh, Mthaka Paul and he says, I told you, right? I told you my medicine is very strong. <laughs> and he praises, he praises himself. Uh, you, I, I must read this praise, <laughs> yeah, he, where he's praising himself. Um, for, um, okay. Yes, so this is where it's towards the end of the trial. It says, after spending some moments in endeavoring to collect my scattered senses, I was astonished to see Vamsinya come, swaggering out of the courtroom. His eyes glared, and as he inflated his chest, he cried, Uvile, Chocho, Bendichilo, Kauvu Vamsinya, Ucho Bella Oamba Nentagagas. Untoya, Omantanta, Ukozila, Umtendes, Omafengu, Aolai. 
This is how it's translated into English. You have felt it. You have got it. I got you. Listen. Oh, Vamsinya, the jobela that flies with the female birds, the brave hawk and the eagle of the twe twe, the rescuer of the scattered vengus. So in these words, he's now glorifying himself. Mm -hmm. In his mentality, he believes that his medicine has actually worked, mm -hmm. right? But the medicine hasn't worked. What has happened is there's been a clash of cultures. So what do we do about, um, about, about this? There are significant lessons, not for 1890, but for 2023. Mm -hmm. The first is the process matters. You know, often when we talk about transformation of the legal system and transformation of the judiciary, we're looking at outcomes. But this case is all about the process. In other words, if you have the wrong process, you are going to distort the outcome. So you've got to have a process that would lend credibility and legitimacy to the outcome. Secondly, the participants matter. It matters who's speaking, right? It matters who is talking. Because we can see what he's saying. He said, listen, if I had been in my court, in my traditional court, everybody would be speaking. And that is why they would accept the outcome. But what is happening here is that there are these foreign lawyers, these foreign judges that are dominating the talking. And we, people who actually know the story, are being crowded out by these lawyers. So, so the question of who participates is very, very, very crucial. Thirdly, the question of who decides is important because he says, you are telling me about this judge who supposed that you knew, but I don't know them. You're saying they're neutral, but I don't know them. This judge came on this, literally on a high horse, you know, literally a high horse. He came on this high horse, and we went there in the morning, because at the beginning, they go there to this courtroom in the morning. And then they're told to wait outside, mm. because the judge has not yet arrived. Mm. He says, even that is surprising, because the trials in Kosaland are held com cool, right? The king is always there. Mm. There's no time where, you, maybe the king is sleeping. But there's no time where the king is traveling from somewhere to get to his house. He is always in his house. So this idea that this decision maker is not in his house is totally foreign. But the important lesson is the person who decides matters. And this assumption we have about sort of Western jurisprudential setup that a judge is more legitimate because an outsider sometimes takes away the legitimacy. Because what people want is that they want to be judged by their own want to be judged by someone they know. They trust Uzanzol, and they trust uh, Eli, and that's the person they want uh, to decide. Right. And then the, the last uh, aspect of it is the feeling that he has. Uh, it's, it's, it's how empathetic, because often when we look at trials, trials are very dry things. They, they are, they've, they've got no humanity in them. Uh, because these decisions are made on the basis of quote-unquote objective facts. But this trial is all about the human beings behind. So, and often, you know, when I look at cases, I look at what is the principle, etc. But what this trial does is to center the human. And we are very insensitive to that story. Because even when we search for the truth, we're not searching for an understanding. And what he is saying in the end is that if you were in closer land, you would not be looking at who is right and who is wrong. You would be looking at how to do justice mm -hmm. among the people that have fought or created conflict. Mm -hmm. And then that's the big lesson for the, uh, from this trial. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, thank you so much, advocate. Okay. Um, he said that we can, can we, um, go a little bit go beyond little bit? Uh, yeah, 3 o'clock. Yeah. So there's going to be plenty of time for everybody to ask questions. Mm. Um, but as a student of religion, I want to just add one or two things about the idea of witchcraft into the conversation. Mm. So one of the things um, that is perhaps interesting, perhaps disturbing, and for me something that we should take note of is the increase in witchcraft killings that we have seen in South Africa mm. in the last 20 years. Mm. So we've seen a huge amount, comparatively, um, over 100 witchcraft killings in Limpopo mm. in the last 12 years. 
and a significant number of witchcraft killings in the Eastern Cape. Mm. And a lot of this has to do with how people are feeling disempowered, voiceless, not heard, don't have a place to speak, and people turning to alternative ways to mm -hmm. try and be heard and be seen. Mm -hmm. And that links back so much to what we have just been talking about. And the other comment that I just want to make from the perspective of religion <coughs> is also for us to think, particularly <coughs> as we move into our age of augmented reality and really begin to experience what 4IR is all about with artificial intelligence. And that is that as people, we are spiritual beings. Um, as humans, we experience the world with all our different senses. And we have multiple different types of faith. And how are we going to work with this and what does it mean to be human in an age of artificial intelligence where we want to take that part of our humanity out of the conversation? So I think that as we move forward and we talk about all the different things that have been raised in, this, in the discussion of this one particular trial, um, questions of inclusion, questions of language are incredibly important but also questions of how we see the world as full and complex human beings that see, hear, smell, feel, taste, and also have spiritual experiences, which are not always the same, and um, for which the question to say, prove it, therefore I believe it, is not always a very useful question, because there are many things that are just as valid um, even if you can't actually physically prove them. Mm. Take the idea of love, for example. The, the, the point that um, I guess we are trying to make, but let me speak, uh, let me not speak on your behalf, it's bad to speak on behalf of, of an advocate, a senior counsel. The point we're trying to make, we're not saying traditional healing, it's, it's rubbish and so on. I remember when I was a student um, at uh, the then Vista University, a friend of mine, his gogo was a traditional healer. And he always, uh, I would make a mistake, he said, oh, your gogo is a witch doctor. He said, hey, hold on. There is a distinction between a witch doctor, tour doctor in Africans, and a healer. A witch doctor hurts people, Traditional healer heals people using uh, traditional medicine, uh, you know, herbs and, 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 and animal products and so on. I'm personally not against whoever believes in, you know, traditional healing, who wants to go and get some bugs and so on to heal a cold or something like that. And before Western allopathic uh, forms of healing, people survived. They dealt with colds and all those things. And that I'm not opposed. That's why we, we have Professor Anna uh, Mutiti there at the back, who's a professor of uh, botany, right, Prof? And she will tell you about all this scientifically that, um, you know, uh, medicine, traditional medicine that has been tested and will tell you this works. I remember attending your lecture, inaugural, inaugural lecture, where you explained, you know, that this is called this and it's supposed to do this, and indeed it does that. And that we have to advance and also protect our protect our, our intellectual property, because people come here, take our knowledge, and then package it and sell it elsewhere. But in terms of these beliefs that somebody comes and say the vice chancellor hates uh, the, the general counsel, or, 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 or I saw how he looked at me, um, you know, or I've got a headache today, he's bewitching me. Then is a problem. There is this meme that I like and I'll shut up, and I guess you get what I'm saying. The bad things, you know, where people believe in things. Oh, there's a cat that walked uh, in front of me, therefore I'm going to die, or things like that, and people get killed. This is what I say we need to, to grow. There is a meme that I liked where there is this guy in a consultation room with a traditional healer, I suppose, and there are bones on the ground, and he says, uh, uh, your boss is bewitching, <laughs> bewitching you. I don't know if you saw it. And, it, and then it, they wrote there, but I don't work. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if advocate would like to chip in. 
No, I think the only thing I, I would say is that uh, I think we've got to be very careful of this idea of witchcraft, the word witchcraft. Yeah. Because it, it contains within it uh, so many embedded uh, racial stereotypes. It's the British that introduced this concept. They come from Europe, they come here, they find traditional things. What they want to do is they want to impose Western medicine. And the way to impose Western medicine is to relegate African medicine into a status that uh, 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 is that of witchcraft. Now, we've then embraced it uh, and, and ran with it. And we also start believing that there is something called a witch doctor. You know? Whereas there are two types of doctors in at least Tosa culture. So one is Igrich, you know, who is more uh, spiritual. Uh, the other is Ikwele, who, who looks more at, at the physical part. You know, if, if, you, if you've got a, uh, an ailment, um, you've got a headache and whatever, so that's what they're looking at. Um, neither is a witch doctor. But the, the British decided that both of them were witch doctors. You know. And then we started accepting that they were witch doctors. Uh, but sort of true magic was always European, you know, where you, you get, uh, um, I mean, the Tosas looked at this as magic. They actually thought the witches were the British. Because how do you take a, a small thing like this, you pull a trigger, then it explodes louder than a lion, and then a man is dead thereafter. That's witchcraft, you see. The Tosas thought these guys were witches. How do you do this? You know, you take a small iron, then pull a trigger, someone is dead. What's a gun? So for a long time, they actually thought this entire thing was witchcraft. Uh, but somehow they, the British were so powerful that they've made us believe it. So the only thing I would say is that I think we have to, we have to deliberately erase from our vocabulary the concept of witchcraft because it's, uh, it's manufactured by the British for purposes of confusing black people to start unbelieving in their own forms of uh, medicine. one of the first questions on the online chat. So the question in the online chat says, um, Prof Maria, is witchcraft a spirituality? Um, and so my answer echoes very much what the advocate has said. Uh, there isn't really such a thing as a witch doctor. Uh, and I'm gonna talk about witchcraft in a minute separately. But we have mainly two types of, of people within African culture, those who are the healers, and then those who are more spiritual, so yes, there is a spiritual element um, and a very strong spiritual element um, to much of different types of um, spiritualities within Africa. Because the, the word African traditional religions is very problematic. Um, and the idea that there is one uniform thing that is African is also very problematic. Um, but I want to take this idea of witchcraft just one step further back. So the British come in with this idea of witchcraft. But the whole idea of the witch is really a male way to try and subjugate women and their abilities to heal. So those people that were seen as witches were women that were talking out very often against male domination of the European churches. And because they were saying that this or that is barbaric, in other words, if a man beats his wife, she should be able to divorce him. But, you know, in um, many parts of Europe's history, that hasn't been allowed. And so women who speak against that are seen as witches. And with this emerges the idea of somebody who isn't quite sane, somebody who is dangerous, somebody who we have to control and contain and manage. And all of those ideas are what get put onto people in Africa. And then we lump everybody together as though they are one. And then there is no understanding for people's language and culture. And then there is no understanding for the herbs that they use. And all of it is a, a case of domination. So um, for me, I was excited by this book because I think these conversations about who we are as people, 
our languages, our cultures, our knowledge, our understanding, our way that we are in the world um, are different all over the world. And we are best as people when we come together and share this wisdom uh, and when we stop using labels and terms that are problematic and, and really are born out of ignorance. Right, then we have on the online uh, somebody who's saying thank you so much, this has been very enlightening. Uh, and then the next question is, with the evolution of the world, this is directed to the judicial side, do witchcraft cases hold weight in court and how does the system implement methods to deal with such? I think the professor should answer that. <laughs> I'm looking at an advocate. I'm looking at the, at, at the advocate. Look, one thing that I can tell you is that there have been a lot of cases, especially crim crim criminal law cases, where people came and said, um, you know, uh, take State versus Bombella, where the guys that I believe I was killing um, an ev evil spirit. And, and, and the guy, if I remember correctly, got away with culpable homicide because he didn't have the intention to kill a person. And there was a case that I forgot the name, it was my first year criminal law in 1994, you'll understand, I can't remember everything, um, where this guy, um, a neighbor told uh, him that you won't see the sunset. You remember? Uh, Self-defense. Uh, uh, and, and, and then he took a machete or something and killed this lady. And he said, look, I believe in witchcraft. This lady, if he said, I won't see a sunset, you know, because they had a dispute or something. And the court said, no, you can't go around killing people because they said you won't see a sunset. <laughs> and he was convicted. So our courts have, have done very well in dealing with this kind, kind of cases to a large extent in, 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 in my, 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 my opinion. I, I hope I've answered um, um, the candidate. Uh, Yeah, I mean, I think that's a, a profound question. Uh, I'm not sure if I know the answers, uh, but I'll probably just reflect on, you know. Uh, I think the point, I mean, I, what struck me with, the, with, especially with the first narration, it's firstly, it's, it's time. This is 1890 when uh, that, that trial is taking place. I mean, the others are 1940, 1956, uh, it said, well the, well, the book is published in 1956. But most of the trials are between 1920 and 1950. You know, but, but this is a 19, in 1890, so it's even before this concept of South Africa, and it's happening in the so-called Cape Colony. And so that is probably why the cultural differences are so uh, 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 pronounced there the, in that trial. But I think, as you point out, it's probably not correct to argue that those cultural differences do not exist today. They, they probably still exist. Mm -hmm. I think that the main, the main point I was trying to make about, about the, 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 the process is that often we, we focus a lot on, on the content, on the outcome, you know, uh, and, and sometimes on the inputs themselves, but we, we forget the, the structure, you know, the, the, the structure of the argumentation, you know, that the legitimacy comes from that structure. And what are the characteristics of the structure? Language is one, right? Participation is another. Decision making is another. Process rights is another. And all of those then define whether the outcome is good or bad. Uh, and, and you can't pre-decide what the outcome is before you've, you've fixed the process. So uh, let me, try and, and, and uh, explore a few themes then around you know, education and schooling. I mean, I hear you the, uh, talking about village schools, but I mean, I was in a village school. Even within a village school, there is a huge difference between how the school is managed and how people that don't go to school manage their lives. Like, how that type of education is taking place, not formal education that's been prescribed by the British and imposed, on, on black people, but how black people that are not contaminated by e European ways resolve uh, or teach their children. So take a, a, a basic example, you know, learning about milking a cow, right? 
you know, that's a repeat thing you do uh, every day, every morning, and you know, you know, when a cow is hungry, when you should not milk it, and at what point you should be taking it to what camp, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, that's a very, very powerful life skill, you know, which you don't get in school, but you get at home, but that's not regarded as education, you know, uh, because education is all formal. It's, learning your ABCs, etc., etc. So there's that problem of the lack of integration of African ways of knowing right, into the, the schooling system. So th that's a huge problem, right? So here, yeah, a lot of people talking about, let's decolonize this, decolonize that, and whatever. Okay, fine, let's do that. But I think until you actually put African ways of knowledge into the curriculum, but that also means African processes of knowledge you know, into, into the curriculum. A teacher is a very powerful thing. It's like a priest, very powerful thing. A priest comes there, they, whatever they say goes. Whether he's right or wrong, you know, anything goes. Mm. But at home, that's not the case. You know, sometimes the mother is wrong, sometimes the father is wrong. Decisions are more sort of uh, uh, consultative and communitarian. So I think that's the point I was, I'm trying to illustrate, is that there is a lot to be said about who decides these things, you know, as opposed to, you know, can you get 10 out of 10? You know. So, and then the last thing I want to say about, you know, asking each kid, you know, if they understood the... There's still a problem about language, you know. In my school, which was a village school, okay, so and maybe the gap there between the school and the village wasn't that big because the teachers came from the village, and so what they tried to do is to use their own methods of learning into the classroom and to make it easy for us to understand, is that they would first teach us in, in, in English. And then after the period, they'll realize that no one understands what's going on. And then they will do the same lesson in Kosa. You know, and then suddenly everyone is alive and asking questions. You know. I, I mean, I don't know here at UJ if any classes are taught in Kosa or Pedi, I mean, uh, Pedi or Tswana or any African language. You know, I don't know. And I don't know what the reasons are if, if these subjects are not taught in indigenous languages. Yeah. If I may come in, th th thanks, thanks, advocate. Um, we, there are measures, you know, where uh, people can have tutorials and go and consult a tutor that speaks a particular language, but I don't know of a class that is specifically, for example, for example, law taught in Zulu or something like that. Although I know that you would get, uh, for example, a study guide with, uh, you know, translated uh, certain concepts in different languages and so on, but we could do more. But I want to bring a different angle to uh, what I consider my side of the answer over and above what the advocate, um, advocate Nkugaitobi has shared. I also come from a, a village school. Um, Prof. Salazar, I think what is important is for us as universities to understand our clients in inverted commas. Um, uh, I remember my first uh, um, weeks at varsity, I missed classes, I think three weeks or something like that. Not that I wanted to bunk classes. I was waiting for a bell to ring. <laughs> I was waiting for assembly. And then this other guy who was much older. He was a nurse and then he started to study. He said, yeah, you don't go to class. And every day I went to, to campus. I was walking around and I go to the cafeteria by quarter <laughs> and go home. And that is when I had no, there's a timetable. You go to lecture halls and so on. I'm like, oh, I didn't know. So sometimes, you know, we take certain things for granted, but we need to understand our clients, our students. And that's why at UJ we've got, for example, the first year experience where we uh, give some orientation to our students because we cannot assume everybody knows what needs to be done. And in our setup, it's not unusual to get a first generation student studying alongside a, a son or a daughter of a professional who knows have been to university and, 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 and things, things like that, you know, that we, we take for granted. Another thing is that we, we, we are diverse people. I mean, yes, I'm black, you're also, you know, I'm a black man, you're also a black man. But I come from Hammond's Club. He comes from the Eastern Cape, different. You know, I didn't want to say certain things from the book because I was afraid my understanding, I was not sure of my understanding. And I like the fact that you unpack this because you understand the culture. Now, we are both black men. But we come from different cultural background. Now, let me bring in other colleagues. Let me bring Prof. Maria, who comes from a different background, and I bring another colleague, which is important for us to learn from each other. But there are differences that we need to respect. I remember I, I'm not an argumentative type of guy that would confront people about things, especially junior colleagues. But one day I entered into this debate with a colleague who said, our law graduates will not get jobs. 
because they can't even look at a person in the eye. I say, look, I don't look you in the eye. If I look at you like this, it means it's war now. But generally, I would look at you and look. <laughs> it's, it's, in my culture, it's respect. And for her, it was like nobody will hire our students because they can't even maintain simple thing, eye contact. And I said, it's not about that. So it's important to understand each other's cultural backgrounds and respect that. If I don't understand your culture, how will I treat you with respect? If I'm your teacher, how will I understand when you understand and when you don't understand and I can give you more support? So we need to invest the resources in under, and time in understanding certain cultural differences and embrace them. And it starts with learning each other's languages because if I learn your language, I'll also understand your culture and misunderstand things. Lastly, this is uh, on a lighter note. I know I don't want to waste time. There are more questions, I'm sure. We had guests from one European country. And I worked here as a researcher. And these guys went to a place where women had, um, you know, let me say traditional, um, uh, what can I call it now? Not makeup, but okay, traditional makeup, mm -hmm. you know? And this lady said, why women are all crazy? I said, what do they do? She said, no, they walk out with this white stuff on their face, uh, you know, during the day. I said, no, it's for beauty reasons. So we also need to educate people anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I think that the maybe let me start with with uh, the language issue. Um, the problem is the is is not. I mean, the Constitution is clear there are 11 languages. It's mm -hmm. also sign language, so, but they must all be given uh, equal respect. So there's no debate about what the Constitution provides. The problem with the judicial system in particular is languages of record, not languages that are in the Constitution, languages of record. Mm -hmm. There are only two languages of record up until now, it's English and Afrikaans. That is a historical problem. But this can be sorted out by regulation to get every language to be a language of record. Uh, when I debated it with the, this was long ago, with the then Minister of Justice, uh, Bridget Mabandla, she said the problem was resources. Because once you say every language is a language of records, and the language of record is the language that keeps the court records. That is why in a trial in, uh, uh, vendor, where the judge is vendor, the, the <coughs> prosecutor is vendor, the attorney is vendor, the witness is vendor. There's still a, a, an interpreter, right? Because vendor is not a language of record, or chivenda is not a language of record. And the same thing in Tosaland or in Zululand, where everybody speaks the language and you go there, you're like, well, this is very odd. The problem is you always need the language in which the record will be transcribed. And that's English and Afrikaans. Now that is where the government has disappointed us because it is inexcusable that after 30 years of freedom, English and Afrikaans is as if we're still in apartheid. It's completely inexcusable. And the issue of resources is also inexcusable. So that's what we need to change so that every language is a language of record depending on where you are. So that even where the judgments have been written in Corsa, like in the, there is a judgment in the Supreme Court of Appeal. It had still to be written in English because there has to be one of the recognized languages of record. You know, it couldn't just be written in Tosa, and then everyone accepts that. You know. uh, and so what they try to do, even when they write, whereas you can have a, a judgment in Afrikaans, there would be no need to produce it, reproduce it in English. You know, that's perfectly acceptable. So, so it, there has been a betrayal by the government by the ANC in particular, in relation to this issue, and its excuse about resources is a ridiculous excuse. So that's what needs to be changed right now. There's no reason not to change it. Um, so let me stop. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, All please, right. could you return to Prof. Petty? Oh. I was enjoying uh, listening to the advocate <laughs> breaking it down. Look, I, I'll, I'll tell you my honest opinion uh, is that if people go to somebody, no matter how gifted or how is that person supposed to be gifted, then identify another as the person who did certain things, and then a group or some people going and killing another human being, to me is barbaric, you know. Uh, I, would, I, would, I would say it's barbaric. 
In terms of witchcraft, I'm not sure if I understood you, but this, uh, when, when you, you, you uh, give your input earlier, something crossed my mind, whether one believes in witchcraft or not, um, it's not what you're saying, but you know, it, it got me thinking. And, and I remember the labor law case and something until I became vice chancellor, I was planning to write this book on witchcraft at work, not that I'm obsessed with witchcraft, because of, <laughs> of, 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 of things around it. There is a case where this lady is a Christian, doesn't believe in witchcraft, but said what a fellow employee was doing, it's clear that she meant harm, you know, to befall her, because she was a manager, and then there was, uh, in terms of a court uh, case, it's, it's reported. Uh, this lady found a slimy, gummy substance smeared on the door, and then, and then in terms of her interpretation, this lady who was seen to be smearing this intended to cause harm, and was dismissed because of that, you know, that bad intention, not that she believes she's a Christian and so on, and it had to be dealt with. Even now, I'm sure if, if I find somebody doing things in my office uh, uh, that, that, that are suspicious, whether I believe or not, not that it's happening, I will definitely have to call HR to deal with the person. So it's, it's, it's something that, you know, at the end of the day, yes, one may think it's uh, important things and so on, um, Somebody once said something that uh, at the convention of traditional healers, somebody said, I don't believe in this thing. And one said, stand there so that I can strike you with lightning. Volunteer. Nobody volunteered. <laughs> so I guess one doesn't want to find out. But that was on a lighter note. Um, um, uh, Prof. Maria. I mean, I do want to say one thing about, about barbarism and witchcraft and as it affects African people. You know, uh, I can't remember your name. There is no society in this world that has been more barbaric than the Europeans, everywhere. You know, uh, I'm writing a book right now called Show Trials of Empire. The first chapter is the killing of Inza. You know, after they shot him, they killed him, he was in a river. They first shot him, he was shot by George Saudi and Harry Smith. There's even a town called he, Harry Smith is a murderer. So he's dead, and there is blood coming out. So they go to him, they chop his ears, right? And then they, I think one of them took a tooth, and then they're still not satisfied, and they cut his uh, head, right? There is another story. Uh, um, written in, uh, when you look at the archives, written in, in uh, ink, that they also took his private parts. Mm -hmm. you know. Now, if a black person had done such barbarism, they would have been accused of witchcraft. You know. But even in terms of sheer numbers, you know, Africans have died in large numbers in the hands of whites. You know, they just murdered so many people. So whenever somebody says, you know, it's barbarism, it's witchcraft, it's black people, you've got to take perspective. Mm. That's the only thing I wanted to add. Mm. All right, um, we really are out of time. So I would like to end here to say thank you very much to everybody for joining us. A big thank you to everybody online and for posting your questions. Thank you to everybody who posted their questions. The University of Johannesburg, the future reimagined.